David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Why, I sought him and he heard me. Amen. We came to worship the Lord. This is Thanksgiving living. Thanksgiving living. This is not just a time of the year, but this is every day of our lives. We've been going through a series called Grace Changes Everything. We are not finished with that series, but we're going to take a, a small break. And we want to look at Psalms 34. Uh, verses 1 through 8. Psalms 34, 1 through 8. And I'm going to read the text, and we're going to see what God has to say and get a word for today so that we can live beyond today to see a new day. Amen. If you're here today, I want you to just praise the Lord in your living rooms and your Vehicles, wherever you're at, I know it's been rough, I know it's been difficult, I know it's been tragedy upon tragedy, but if you are here today, you made it from yesterday, and if you made it today, there's a great possibility, no, 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 if God has a purpose and a plan for you, you'll make it through today to live to see tomorrow, but until you get there, praise him right now. The Bible says, and let's go to our text on today. One of my very favorite passages of Scripture. The Bible says, a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Uh, in the English Bible, that would be the inscription. But in the uh, Hebrew Bible, that is actually the first verse. So the first verse for us, which is the second verse for them, says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear uh, thereof and be glad. David says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I saw the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all, all of my fears. The Bible says, look unto him and be enlightened and your face will not be ashamed. This poor man cried, this poor woman cried, this poor boy and little girl cried, and the Lord heard him or her and saved them out of all of their troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and delivered them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. And I said I was going to stop at verse 8, but I'm going to go on a little further. It says, oh, fear the Lord, ye, he sent, ye his saints, for there is no lack to them that fear him. That's Psalms 34, 1 through 9. Uh, just... I want to pitch this idea. We may be here for two to three weeks. I don't know, but we will get back to our series. Grace changes everything. But just for a few moments, I have pinned this text. I got a reason. I got a reason. And now I want to explain to you real quickly. I want to just give you this. I'm going to just give you this. It's a great ball of wax right here. Uh, but reason is a call. An explanation or justification for an action or event. Good or obvious cause to do something. We have reason to celebrate. And listen, logically speaking, it is a premise of an argument in support of a belief, especially a minor premise when given after the conclusion. 
Uh, the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments by process of logic. I got a reason. I, 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 this is based on something. So the title that we're going to pin is I Got a Reason. I Got a Reason. Uh, Psalms 34 and Psalms 56 bear the same inscription. When David changed his behavior before the king uh, of Bimelech. Now, the Psalter contains 14 psalms introduced by words linking them to incidents in the life of King David. These introductions are not always helpful for understanding the psalms they introduce, but sometimes they are, and that is undoubtedly the situation we have on today. Uh, as he said, the title bears an inscription, when David changed his behavior or pretended to be insane. Uh, the incident to which this refers is recorded in 1 Samuel 21, the actual chapter, 1 Samuel 21, and then the first verse of 1 Samuel 22. It, it talks about how that David ran from King Saul. Uh, uh, listen, David was fleeing from his great enemy, King Saul, and his circumstances seemed to be so desperate. I, I heard a song in my spirit earlier that said, don't let your situations get you down. Uh, in our pastor, we're going to talk about fears and afflictions and frustrations and irritations, and I, I want to submit to you today and here it is. Here's a window to look through. Don't ever relieve the person of their fear. Some of the things that we go through are downright terrifying, dreading, and it causes people to shake and bow to their knees, but only while you're looking at the situation. For when you look up and see someone who is bigger, badder, better, and greater, your situation is harsh, but it, it seems to pale in comparison to the Almighty God. And that's what we want to do. Never forget that there is a God who has the gauge over life's circumstances. And I'm going to submit real quick, real quick, that don't get your problem mixed up with God. God is not your situation. God is not your struggle. God is not your demise, so to speak, but God is in the struggle with you. And a lot of times we allow our troubles to camouflage God. But God is still good. Asaph said, surely, truly, God is good. He's good not only some of the time, but if, if, we, be, if we be truthful, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Truly, he is good. Good. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. The song says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. He's good. He never ceases to be good. And if he's been good, I know he's been good. If you are alive and in the land of the living, he has been good. Don't ever take it for granted that you woke up you woke up because he touched you to wake up. So he is good. Desperate times, desperate situations. David must have felt extremely desperate because Gath had been the home of Goliath, the Philistine champion. And so we believe that David was at a low point in his life. Have you ever been at a low point in your life when it seemed like life Problems and life issues and bills do were enveloping you, enveloping in you. Now, develop means to bring out the beauty, but envelop means like an envelope to, to seal it and close you in. Sometimes troubles seem to weigh us down. They do mental games with us. And, and so we feel like we are in a horrible pit. But Psalms 40, 1 through 3 says, God has brought me up out of my horrible pit. And he put my foot on a rock. He established my going. And he put a praise in 
my mouth. I got a reason. Because I woke up, I got a reason. Yes, there's COVID. Yes, there's racial pressure. Yes, the government has lost their mind. Yes, uh, I got a relative right now in the hospital dealing with uh, 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 lupus. Yes, my mom hurt herself. Yes, but God is bigger. God is greater than anything that I could ever deal with. And to God be the glory for the things that he has done. I got a reason to praise the Lord. Don't ever lose your reason. And the reason why we lose our reason is because we take our eyes off of God and put them on our situation. As Peter did. As long as Peter had, uh, had, 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 had his sight on God. He was walking on top of turbulent water. But the moment he started to listen to the atmosphere, you got to be careful listening to the atmosphere. Love the atmosphere. Love the hearsay, the he say, the she say, and focus on God. Situations change. Circumstances change. But trust. We will trust in the name of our God. I have a reason to praise him, to honor him, to glorify. Matter of fact, because I have a reason, I can live to see another day. You've got to fight to see another day. I've got a reason. So Psalm 34 is an interesting psalm. First of all, we want to look at the fact that it is an acrostic psalm. In the original Hebrew text, every verse begins with a different letter of the alphabet. Listen, in those days, books were scarce, and the acrostic was a popular device to aid memory. David wanted his experience and his escape, and above all, the lesson, the theology he had learned about God's character to be remembered down through the generations. That's why Solomon said, from every generation, and listen, Lord, you are God. Because he wanted people not to forget what God did for him. And if he did it before, he can do it again. The same God was there is here. Now, don't forget the ability. Don't forget the authority of God. He is on the throne. God is not a sleepy friend. In the, in the words of Dr. H.B. Charles, he is here and he is us. Uh, he has the authority in his hands. The Bible says that all power, all authority is in the hands of God. Of God. Put your hands in the hands of a man that steals the water. And so David writes this amazing psalm in the form of an acrostic because he wanted it to be remembered. We want to look at this psalm in detail and we want to just shadow, just shadow uh, Samuel uh, and look at some things, the background text, 1 Samuel 21, 12, and then 1 Samuel 22, 1. Uh, this psalm was written by David, the future king of Israel, the one that killed Goliath. If you were to turn to 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 2, David lied. Yeah, David, God's man, lied. And sometimes you lie. And listen, pressure will bring sometimes the worst out in us. And Psalms, I'm sorry, excuse me, 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 2, David went to the town of Nob to see the priest Ahimelech. David says that I'm on king's business. He wasn't on king's business. He was running away from King Saul. The Bible says that the king has sent me on a private matter. And so I, I, I'm coming here. And then David asks the priest Ahimelech for something to eat. And he was offered the showbread. The showbread represents Jesus Christ. That's where we drop down to 1 Samuel 21, 3 through 4, and 6, which is the bread of his presence. Now, David is running from Saul. 
David lies because he is in a dire situation. David asks for food and gets the showbread, right? And then David asks for some armor. And then the prophet Elimelech said, I have the sword of Goliath that you use to destroy him. David says, do you have a spear or a sword? He said, no, but I have Goliath's sword, the one that you killed in the valley of Eli. And then, then he says, this particular sword is wrapped in a cloth. Now catch this. Next to the ephod. And, uh, listen, and then we see that in 1 Samuel 21, 9. And then when David leaves Ahimelech's presence, he goes over to uh, Gath. And when he gets there, they recognize David because David was the champion and they were serenading David because he had killed his ten thousands. And they said, is this not the king of the land? I want to show you something about David, which is also true about us. When we begin to run in fear, we forget some most vital things, some most valuable things. David lied, shouldn't have lied. David ran, and then David ran into the showbread, which was representative of Jesus Christ. And then David was presented Goliath's sword for his armor. Why did not that jog his memory? Oh, the God that helped me will help me now. But David was on the run. He was running in fear. And imagine this fear will immobilize you. David is running in fear and mobilized to stand and trust God. Then he runs and the, 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 Ahimelech says, look, he says it's so strange. He says, David, I got Goliath's sword right here. Remember, you killed Goliath. I got that sword. David says there's no sword like the sword of Goliath. And he says, but check this out. It's wrapped up next to the ephod. Now, the ephod represented prayer. And intercession. Why did not David stop to pray? Why don't we stop the prayer? He has the sword of Goliath, which he killed Goliath with. That was a triumph, right? And then the ephod, which is prayer, which we can engage God for strength to go forward. None of these things jog David back to what God had Done. And then he gets over into foreign territory. They said, isn't this David the one that killed Goliath? And David gets scared. He said, the one, he is the king of the land. David not once jogged his mind back to all of these milestones. So David is afraid. David acts a fool in front of the king, Achish of Gath. And then the king says, get this guy out of here. I like the text. He says, get him out of here because he's uh, acting like a bad. I got enough mad men. I got enough people insane around me. And so he, the king uh, exiles David. David goes to the cave of Adullam. Which is where we pick up Psalms 34. Now, uh, they say that David turned the cave of Adullam into a cathedral because he was reminded of what God had done, and because he did it before, he'll do it again. And so, as we go to our text on today, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times because his praise, his praise will be in my mouth because I saw them and he heard. He says, I will. And long as there is a will, there is a way. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Let's go back with all times, all seasons, through losses and crosses. God is the steady in my life. He has been good, he is good, and he will, he, will, he, he will forever be good. 
So David says, I will bless him. I will barak him. I like that. Barak means to get down on your knees. Get down on your knees. I like what David is saying. He said, I will barak him. It means to bend the knee. The Greek form of this word is eulogeo, which means to speak well of God. It, 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 it means to bow down and open up your mouth because he has been good. Barak him. Now, I want to I I open up three things about kneeling. First of all, kneeling is a position of surrender. I like that because when we kneel before God, we are saying, Lord, you are sovereign. You have absolute control. I give in to you. I relinquish my rights to rule, my rights to reign over my life. I give myself away to you. Friend, beloved, when we totally surrender to God, he assumes full responsibility for our lives. So it is a position of surrender. Joshua 5.13 5, 13 and 14 paints this uh, kneeling position of surrender very well. The Bible says that Joshua when Joshua was near the town of Jericho he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or are you foe? And this man said, neither one. He replied, I am the commander of the Lord's armies. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? So kneeling is a position of surrender. Uh, but then kneeling is a position to receive provision. Provision. Where we come to God because we are depleted of power and we need to be gassed up. Again, some of us are running on empty and we need to be encouraged. We need to be built. We need to be gassed up. Listen, where we come to him with no sense of direction, the song says... When I have lost my direction, God is the compass for my soul. Where we come to God because we are in complete despair, realizing that he is my only source, not a resource. He is my source. 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46. I've got to read this. The Bible says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. That's 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. Servant went and looked, and he went seven times. He said, I don't see nothing. Then the Bible says on the seventh time that he came back, he said, I see the cloud of the size of a man's handprint. So Elijah shouted and said, Ahab, go, because the rain is coming. When we kneel down, we receive bounty from God. We receive power from God. So David says, I will bow down in reverence, realizing that he is greater than me, and I need him to fill me up because I'm empty. Fill me up because I am in despair. The Bible says uh, that he is, uh, the, he is the king of the throne of grace. So when we are in need, we can come to him and find favor. So I barack him. That's Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. But I want you to look at this. Kneeling is a position of power. 
a position of power. The ox's greatest pulling strip is found when they get down on their knees. What is the meaning here? Well, I think if we would get down on our knees and pray, things would happen. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. God says, if they pray to me and repent and turn from their evil, they have been doing, then I will hear them in heaven and forgive their sins and make their land prosperous again. Not only would things happen, but then things could happen. John 16, 24 from the Living Bible, Jesus says, you haven't tried this before, but begin now. Ask using my name and you will receive and your cup of joy will over." Flow. Kneeling is a place of surrender. Kneeling is a place of provision. Kneeling is a position of power. And kneeling is a position of praise and worship. Did you hear me? Provision, power, and worship. Listen, the Bible says in Psalm 95, 1 through 7. It says, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him. Did you hear what I said? The sea belongs to him, for he made it. Beloved, if he made you, you belong to him. Oh, and what did I say before? If you surrender to him, all to Jesus, all you know, he assumes full responsibility for your life. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, we are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. I'm going to read one more passage of scripture. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 from the message. It says, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He can show up any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worry, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into worship. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful. What happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life? Listen, friends. Praise is not about us. It's about him. David says, I will bend the knee and worship him. Receive from him. Be invigorated by him. One more passage. I got to read this and we're done for today. Psalms 137, 1 through 4 from the Amplified. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we captives sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, the city God imprinted on our hearts, on the willow trees in the midst of Babylon, we hung our hearts. For there they who took us captive demanded of us to sing one of Zion's songs. And they said, how can we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? The reason why we can worship him is because he is the steady. He will always be good. He is my rock. He is my shield. He is my light. He is my deliverance. He is the glory and the lifter up of my head. Psalms 3 says, many, oh Lord, are rising up against me. Many are saying there is no help for me in God, but thou, 
oh Lord, are a shield for me. You are the glory and the lifter up of my head. I went to sleep and I realized I woke up and the Lord sustained me. I'm not feared because of evildoers because soon they'll be cut down like the grass. Wait on him and he'll keep you. He'll sustain you. He'll be good to you. Listen, this is the first part of this. I've got a reason. I've got a cause because he is good. And we'll finish this we got a couple of engagements to preach this week. And I think I'm going to finish this over at this chapel engagement that I got this week. But I've got a reason to praise him. Listen, we're praying for you. We love you. And I want to encourage you to come to him. All that are under a heavy load, that are, that are toiling, that are under pressure, that are, are in distress, that are depressed, that are oppressed that are suppressed, and give your life to God. He says, come to me just like you are and let me change you. Let me mold you. Let me make you all over again. He's willing to do it. I want to encourage you, allow him to do it. And you'll begin the process of progress. And then we want to invite you to be a member of this fellowship where your gift and your talents are needed and valued and will be treasured. Actually, you will partner with us to do kingdom work, to do kingdom building. And what we have for you, there's none like other. We will live life and do life together. And if you feel led to be a blessing of this ministry, Church Beyond Walls, you can do so via our cash app platform, uh, which is the dollar sign, Church Beyond Walls. You can also do so via our Venmo platform, which is Church Beyond Walls. We love you, and we are praying for you. And we'll see you again this same time next week. May the Lord bless you and keep you is our prayer.